Welcome to the SRS Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron J. Babiar, and I'm the Training Director of Support Raising Solutions. Whether you're a new ministry worker or a veteran looking to increase your competence and confidence, Support Raising Solutions seeks to bless you in your quest to be a spiritually healthy, vision-driven, fully funded Great Commission worker. My guest today is actually uh, two guests. I have a wonderful privilege of, of welcoming both Danielle Sparks and Erica Fouché of Every Nations. And so, first of all, welcome to both of you. I, I don't I don't recall doing a uh, three people uh, over or the internet at least sort of sort of recording before. So we're doing kind of a new thing. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, Aaron. We're so honored to join you today. Glad to be here and speak specifically on the topic that we're going to discuss. It's going to be a great yeah. time. Yes, I, I really believe it will. So uh, we've been able to have uh, Danael on a handful of times before, and uh, I'm sure some of his personality and who he is will come out a bit over these recordings. But Erica, this is your your first time being on the podcast, on the SRS podcast. So we're very honored that you could join us as well. Um since some of our listeners know at least a little bit about Danielle, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you first to take a take a minute or so here and tell us a little bit about you and where you're from and your role with Every Nation. Just just yeah, introduce yourself a little bit, please. Okay, great. So I've been with Every Nation for nine years, and I'm originally from North Carolina, which is where I first encountered the ministry as a college student at UNC Chapel Hill. Became a campus missionary initially, was serving on UCLA's campus, did that for five years. Uh, Towards the end of my time on campus, I began coaching in MPD and moved to Nashville where our regional headquarters is and continued with coaching and then eventually became the MPD uh, director for our ministry. Great, great. So you in North Carolina and then you're in California and now you're in Tennessee. Did I get that right? That's right. So who do you even root for in college basketball? Still North Carolina. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So this is a bad time to bring up that I like Duke. I'll just move on. So <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. I, and uh, of course, Danielle, I know you're probably a USC guy all the way, right? All the way. Uh, all the I way. have a, a few coaching changes in mind, but I, I'm still rooting for <laughs> USC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, um, well, again, thank you guys for both being on here. I have so looked forward to our time together today. And, and of course, you know, we're recording this at a time that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on. In our nation, of course, uh, you know, COVID has affected everybody globally. But within the U.S., we're, you know, we're looking at uh, election season. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of, of you know, conversation around race and Black Lives Matter, and uh, and then sometimes there are some other things that are brought into that conversation that uh, may or may not belong. And you know, we're having you know some some great. Uh, people actually standing up and, and saying, "Hey, you know that there, there is a problem," and then there's other people that that uh, are are trying to deny that there's any problems ever, and then and then you have just straight up, you know, just riots sometimes that uh, right. it's just so confusing. Even for brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, I think a lot of us are like, "Okay, we love God, we love people, we want to care," uh, but but also we're not sure necessarily how to move forward. How, how do we handle this conversation? And then, and then we throw on the whole prism of raising support right. <laughs> in a time when everything's right. going crazy. And so, so Danielle, I, I think that that's kind of what started our conversation about a month or so ago. Right. Uh, when I just said, Hey, uh, Brother, friend, I think I need your wisdom. I, I think I need to invite you back onto the, the podcast and for us to talk about this again. And, and Erica, I've only been able to spend a little bit of time with you, but I know that you're just fantastic. And I was like, hey, would you all would you all join me? And so I know you guys said yes, but I wanted to set that up for the listeners and realize right. just how this this just kind of came together where we said, hey, let's let's dig into this. Let's not run from this conversation. Let's have it intentionally. So with all that being set up, um, wow. We've just exchanged a couple of emails. We haven't pre-rehearsed this this conversation, but what are some of your initial thoughts as we begin to, to broach in on this topic? Yeah, um, we actually just had a training uh, a few weeks ago with some of our 
missionaries in training. So we're launching them out to begin developing their initial partnership team. And one of the scriptures that we kept harping on in the six weeks leading up to the training and then during the training was in Esther, where it talks about who knows that you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so this is something that we've really been encouraging our missionaries with is God has brought you to this point for such a time as this. It's mm. not something to shy away from. I know a question could arise in people's hearts. Is this even the time to develop partnership? How do I develop partnership? And the reality is that God has set for us the times and seasons and places for which we are born and live. And that having that perspective that he has called us, that he's brought us to this point for his purposes, I think will help us to be open to what he might be wanting to do in our own lives and hearts and through us as we go about doing the work and the ministry of partnership development. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And so really, one of the questions that that's out there that um, honestly it and I, I don't want to to make light of where we're at currently uh, in in society at least within the U.S. But one of the common questions globally when there's something big going on, uh, whether it's natural disaster, uh, social issues, uh, you know, pandemic, or whatever else is is the question with, for missionary types is, is this season a good time to, to be building and maintaining partnership? Like, do I, do you know, may, maybe I shouldn't be doing this to which I, I'm hearing you say, Oh no. You, yeah. This, this is, this, this is, this is a time to be, to be doing that. Tell, tell me more about that, Danielle, as far as like how, how you're with, with even the trainings you've done in house within your organization, how have people interacted with that idea? You know, one of the things that we, encourage our missionary is, is, as Erica mentioned, is the reality of one single thing, is that God is not surprised at what we're facing. Mm -hmm. And when Erica talked about Esther and being born for such a time of this as this, the reality is, is that we could have been born at any time. We could have been set apart to serve Christ at any part of the spectrum of of, of mankind, but God chose in this season for us to represent him at this time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I share with our missionaries is that because this question comes up, is now then the right time? My answer is absolutely, because God has more than equipped you and made you ready to respond to the age that you're in. The advantage that you have is that, especially when turmoil comes up or crisis arises, is that everybody's talking about the same thing. When mm. crisis doesn't exist, everybody's talking about something different. But now everybody's talking about the same thing. And mm -hmm. because they're talking about the same thing, it's easier to bring, bring Christ into the context. How yeah. would Christ respond? What would the Lord do? What would the Lord have me do? And yeah. because we're all talking about the same scenario and the same circumstance, maybe we have different attitudes and perspectives about what's going on, but we all see that something that we're all looking at is actually happening. And yeah. so now it's a conversation piece. Yeah. The crisis now is a conversation piece to introduce Christ. And so yeah. I so see it as a great time. Now, uh, matter of fact, just, just by way of story, I was, I was, getting a few things together and I stopped in, uh, in Panera and now I'm advertising a coffee place, but I stopped in the local coffee shop and the conversations were the same at the coffee table across from me as it was at my kitchen table with my family. Mm -hmm. And I yearned to jump into the conversation because I knew what they were talking about. I knew where they were going. I knew the, the pain points they were discussing. And so I think it's, it's actually not that it's, better to be in this season, but God has made us ready for this season. Yeah. We're all talking about yeah. the same thing that actually helps move the conversation forward. So really, I think you know, I'm just going to paraphrase what I heard you say here in my own words. And if I, if I get it wrong, by, by all means, please correct me. But I, instead of being paralyzed by the conversation because it, you know, there can be some high emotions and, 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 uh, Boy, just a lot of detail and minutia and stuff like that that people get into. We should instead see it as an opportunity to bring Christ, to, to bring really the only thing that fixes the sin in, in our world, to bring Absolutely. Christ into the equation. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that even, that would even, you know, potentially 
involve inviting people to be a part of our support team. It doesn't have to be uh, a completely uh, dichotomized conversation that only exists right. in, in one in one box. So, and Eric, and I'll add this on. One of the things I encourage our our missionaries with is this also this other reality is that in these conversations there are plenty of people who are talking and don't come to a conclusion. They don't come to a place where they have the answer, and in their heart they're crying out, "I need an answer. I need help. I can't figure this out." And others are crying out, "Lord, if you're real, if you love me, if you love this country or love this community, then provide something." And what I've encouraged our students with, and I'm encouraged with this also is that God has provided the answer, and that answer is you and me. The solution to the problems that the world is facing, God has deposited through Christ in us. And and I share with them, look, the political solutions we're looking for, even if we get everything we want or get everything that's asked for, we already know those solutions are temporary. Yeah, they're going to come up short. Right, because we're not facing a skin problem. We're really facing a sin problem. And when sin is dealt with and reconciliation is received, that's when the beginning of the solutions can actually be applied. Because everything else, and I'm saying this as a Christian, is temporary. Yeah. And so the answer that God has given to the world is us, is Christ in us. Awesome. Awesome. Now, along these lines, um, we we totally acknowledge that there are tensions that exist in our society. And of course, this this episode can be for anybody anywhere, but we're, we're probably mostly talking to Americans in this particular series. Um, uh, but it, it's open to anyone because obviously racism exists uh, globally. It's like like you said, it's a it's a sin problem. Um, and, and so uh Turns out there's sinners outside of the U.S. as well, <laughs> for sure. Um, but uh, this, you know, the, the tensions that are there in our society and in MPD, um, those tensions are a result of of the fall. They're they're not just racial issues. Um, and so, but within that, though, I'll, you know, we need to acknowledge that, um, you know, there are tensions that that people face or around that issue, uh, even, you know, of course, not exclusively, but certainly uh, missionaries of color face as well. And, uh, you know, we that gets into our deeper and, you know, our deeper identity and uh, alignment with with God and and his, his greater vision and, and truth that he calls us to. So as we dig into some of that and you, you referred to to uh, Esther already, but I also know that you you guys had a, had a few scriptures in mind that just go along the lines of what already has been said, but but Erica, kind of point us to some of those scriptures, if you would, some of the some of the things that that has been significant for you personally, but even as you've trained people within your organization around this topic. Yeah, a couple come to mind. One, First Corinthians five seventeen, that we have become a new creation in Christ. I was even reading in Galatians this morning, and it talks about how. Uh, with the flesh, that we've actually come into a greater uh, reality of our identity by the Spirit. And so for me, uh, as I was navigating developing my initial partnership team, there was a specific community that I was initially engaging and also felt that the majority of my partnership team would come from. And that turned out to not be the case. And so one of the major things that God began to speak to me about was my identity as a son. I mean, that was really the beginning of him opening my eyes to there's a greater identity that I put inside of you that goes beyond the one that you have uh, clung to um, for the majority of your life that has shaped who you feel like you can go to and Mm -hmm. who you think your partnership team is going to come from. And Mm -hmm. so when he began to shape uh, my identity from a place of son, I began to see the perceived resources that I had were actually much bigger than I expected. Mm -hmm. And instead of looking just uh, in these narrowed places, God had actually opened the door for a wider berth of provision. And Mm -hmm. I just think of Elijah Uh, When he uh, had to go from place to place, from 
one uh, aspect of miraculous provision to another, there's a point where it talks about where the, how the brook dried up. And that was very much what happened for me is my perceived places of resources, that brook dried up and it forced me to have to be able to, one, look at God in a bigger way than I was, one, to allow him to shape me and, and my identity and, and who I am. And three, it mm -hmm. opened the door for me to be, act, be able to actually engage people of different cultures. And it's not just mm -hmm. the culture outside of the African-American community, but how do I engage business people? How do I mm -hmm. engage pastors? How do I engage teachers? And, and God was teaching me something about the call that he'd actually placed on my life and that it was much bigger than what I had originally uh, thought. Awesome. Awesome. One of the things that uh, when we were kind of preparing to talk about this, um, and again, I, I, you know, I realize as people are listening to podcasts, they don't necessarily know all the, what goes into the prep. Like I'm, I very much love shooting from the hip sometimes. Uh, people can probably tell I apologize, uh, <laughs> but, but other times uh, I'm like, Hey, give me, you know, give me a couple of, uh, you know, key points or something that you're wanting to make sure we, we touch on. And I was really thankful. Uh, you guys just sent me an email with a couple of ideas, but one of the things that, that really captured my eyes it was, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, who, who, which of you wrote this, but one of you said something along the lines of, you know, let's, let's deal with attacking the spiritual issue in racial clothing. And I was like, wow, right. that's a powerful statement, you know, and just like when you said, uh, Danielle, when you said we're dealing with a sin problem, not a skin problem, that's a, man, that, that, that's a, a great kind of visual of, okay, yeah. Yeah, we all know there's an issue here, but what's really going on there? So sure. Danielle, tell us more about that. You know, one of the topics that we're covering as we discuss this are knots and tensions. And, and Eric and I, as we went through this, in order for a knot to form, there has to be tension. A knot is a stopping point, an entanglement mm -hmm. that takes time to unravel and sometimes takes teamwork to unravel. So when I think about even the conversation we're having today and looking at the scriptures when it comes to partnership development, engaging others, especially in, in hard conversations, uh, there's really two things. One, I have to look at the people I'm talking to differently. Um, God's called me to not just be a minister to people who look just like me and have my background, but mm -hmm. don't look like my, me and don't have my background. And I love what Ephesians six twelve says, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. What I'm seeing is not my enemy, but we wrestle against principalities and against powers and against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I have to constantly remind myself that sometimes the opposition and pushback and even the things that I'm feeling in my own soul are not things from the spirit of God. They're things that I have to wrestle against, against spiritually. And if I forget the spiritual battle then I'm going to start looking at the wrong places for my solutions. And ultimately, and I think this is true with the gospel and this is true with building a partnership team. I have to engage others. I have to find a way to sit down, tell them where I am, tell them how I feel, tell them what my vision is, and then trust the Holy Spirit to add them. I may not win them, but the Holy Spirit definitely adds them. So when I look through this process, there's a trust that has to well up in me. If, if I let my circumstances, if I let the swirling conversation, the smoke of, of tension rise up, then I'm going to be misled into a process where I'm no longer untying the knot. I'm actually making it tighter. Mm -hmm. And so these knots and tensions, though, however, they are a natural part of becoming who God's called us to be, where God unravels us. Mm -hmm. God begins to untangle us. God begins to straighten out mm -hmm. areas of our lives that he wants to straighten out. And see, mm -hmm. the, the world, and I know I'm speaking on a, on a grand scale here, but the world wants us shaped a certain way. Mm -hmm. But God wants us shaped like him. And so I, I, one of the greatest ways, at least for me, uh, that I've found the Holy Spirit working on me is through the partnership process. And so when yeah. I think of knots and tensions, these are 
as, as we described earlier, parts of the rope of partnership in the tangled age that we're in that we have to work out and unravel. Yeah. We have to deal with it. We can't skip over them. We can't let them pass by. We have to stop, pause, and begin to pull them apart. And I think this is the season to do it. This is yeah. where, where God has his finger. That's such a great visual because, um, you know, I hadn't thought through that, the, the backside of that, of, you know, if you're, if you're not, if you're not untangling it you, and you're just, you're, you're attempting to, you know, pretend it's not there, you're actually probably causing that not to get tighter. You're, right. you're, you're not making it better. You're making it worse. And, and that is, that's such a great analogy um, that, you know, of course, totally acknowledge it, you know, the tension uh, we're talking about with in, in, in regard to race and society and stuff like that. But, hey, support raisers, that's true in a lot of other ways as yeah. well. Like, like, Danielle, I know you and I have spoken before about the lies that we believe and how that can right. keep us uh, right. from raising support. And, um, you know, that makes me think of uh, how frequently I have heard brothers and sisters in Christ from um, all over the world, not just from the U S but I think probably from every state in the U S I have had a brother or sister in Christ tell me, well, I can't raise support because insert excuse here, uh, insert, insert lie that we're believing here. And it's always something that they're believing it. And they're, you know, to use your analogy, they're making that, that not, tighter instead of unraveling it and, and pursuing truth and pursuing right. what God has put in front of them. Right. Yeah. I, I remember talking to several missionaries of color who were going on their seasons of focus during the summer. And they, at the end of the day, all came with the question of, you know, how do I have these sorts of discussions that are going on with some of my partners who are white and, mm-hmm. um, say what I feel and have experienced, and then also bring some reality of what's happening in the world that they might not agree with when money is tied to it. So the question ultimately Mm. for them was, can I have these sorts of discussions and we might not agree on everything, but at the end of the day, their trust was in this person for finances. And I I said to all of them, you know, ultimately in partnership, God is asking us to rely on him for provision and for resources. And when we look at the person sitting across from us as the solution to that, as Danelle brought up, putting uh, putting wrong places of, of solutions that we're looking for, when we're looking at the person across from us as the solution for the financial need, then we won't actually engage in a level of truth and self-examination of what is true and bring that into the discussions that right. we have with potential partners. Right. And if we make it just about money, then we'll never go deeper into the transformative work that God is wanting to do in us and also us in, as the body of Christ as we're engaging potential mm-hmm. partners and fellow believers and helping one another come to a measure of truth of what God has said and what God is doing in the earth. So. Right. Good. Very good. Hey, I just want to take a few seconds and mention something. Outside of the Bible, the book I most frequently recommend to great commission-focused leaders is The God Ask by Steve Shadrach. I'm humbled to say that Steve is a friend of mine who actually helped pioneer support raising solutions. And if you haven't read his book, you're missing out. Instead of going into a support raising appointment fearing what people might say, you can have confidence that God is superintending the whole process. This book will help you embrace the fact that biblical support raising is not a man ask. No, it's actually a God ask. And it's available at cmmpress.org where you can receive a 10% discount if you use the code SRS podcast. And, you know, I, I love that be, um, for a lot of reasons. One of which is, and Callie Blue Colt's the best at this. Callie always says, it's not about the money. <laughs> and, and we realize we need finances. We need, to, we need to raise up a team of people that are going to pray and partner with us for the sake of the kingdom as, as missionary types. Uh, but but that's, the money is not the, uh, it's not the end goal. It's glorifying God is the end goal to inviting people to be a part of the great commission work that we get to do with them for his glory. And, and yeah, I, I, lo- I love how you, you, you put that as far as, hey, you know, your dependency really isn't on 
those those people. In fact, that that similar um, that similar conversation, I think, can can draft into a whole different other you know areas as well uh, yeah. beyond beyond the the, the tension that exists uh, with, with with the discussion of race right now in the U.S. in particular. Uh, but but it, it is just, it's just there. We don't want people. We don't want to be dependent on people. Like we right. want to be dependent on God and who He He brings to our team, and um, that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean we shouldn't do math and that we don't need funds. I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that, but you know where our focus is that's that's really important because that that even informs sometimes what where we go and where we don't go in our conversations. Wouldn't you right. agree? Absolutely. Yes. Where we go, where we don't go, who we ask, who we don't ask, what we ask for. Mm-hmm. And what we don't ask for in terms of amount, and, and when we were talking about even identity, I think that plays into this realm of worth. And if you are looking at your worth in terms of your earthly identity and solely your earthly identity and what experiences and the ways in which you may have been brought up or who may have been in the community around you, then again, I think we, we short circuit the plethora and range of provision that God actually has in store for us. And as much as we're responding to a ministry call, our potential partners and partners are responding to a call as well. And it's by the spirit of God, not Mm. according to the flesh. Mm. You know, Aaron, I'll add on to this with a history now in the U S and in partnership development. What I have found is, especially for my partners that are not ethnic minorities, they actually want to have a safe, informative, educational conversation, even if it leads to conviction and repentance. I've actually had these conversations now with some of my partners who said things that I did not disagree with, but I sat down with them, biblically reasoned with them, shared history with them, and they've actually repented, but they didn't repent as as evil wrongdoers. They repented as from friend to friend. Danelle, I didn't know that. Danelle, mm-hmm. I didn't understand it. Or I've always had this question, but you're a safe person I felt I could ask. Mm-hmm. And so I've had those conversations, but that had a lot to do with the relationship we've built, that they knew this was not about the money. This was about the calling that God's brought us into together. And so it, they, they, there has to be a safe conversation. There has to be a safe place. And I think as Christians, we're obligated to provide it. And I and I say this because I have friends and partners who are yearning. My phone has been ringing off the hook. They're yearning to talk to somebody that can hear them out and gain help them gain perspective. Somebody they can exchange ideas with without being castigated, without being put down without being mm-hmm. categorized in a way they don't appreciate because the conversations that we must have should be had in a way where they're still edified or we're still edified and built up to follow Christ even better than we did previously. Mm. Mm. What a good word. Yeah. You know, even in hearing you, you know, what you just shared, it reminded me of a time in my life. Uh, one of my, closest friends in, in the world is ethnic minority. And I, I, I can I recall a time when we were in our late twenties or early thirties where um, I just, I wanted his perspective. You know, I was hearing different things from different people about, about uh, you know, race and culture. And of course this goes back, I'm an old guy now. So this is like, <laughs> this is like 20 years ago, but um, you know, it was, it was so good to have a, a safe place place where I could ask questions that, um, you know, I didn't feel like I was going to get, I was going to get shot for asking, just trying to, trying to gain some perspective. And, uh, uh, man, I'm so thankful for his love and his, his friendship and and even helping me see some different perspectives. And, um, the fact that we have people out there who are people of of color, ethnic minorities, however you want to say that, that are raising support sometimes, or even oftentimes, you know, outside of outside of the, the community in which they were perhaps raised or their, their family of origin, that's not a bad thing. It might be a difficult thing, but that might be a fantastic that, that that's a road of trust and relationship for the sake of the kingdom that can also lead 
to uh, some of those th- those heart change type conversations like it sounds like what you've been able to have to nail that's I'm, that's incredible I appreciate you bringing that up that's a that's a very necessary part I believe in the sharpening of each other for, for the glory of God uh, and, and I know for the sake of recording we might have to change a few things but um, I'll say this I truly believe and I know Erica does as well that I there's nobody that I meet by accident. God has appointed us to come together. Whether they say yes or no, the partnership in many ways is irrelevant. This is still part of my ministry to yeah. engage saints and sinners with the mm-hmm. gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way where both of us end up looking more like Christ when all is said and done. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the ministry that I have. And, and that's yeah. the ministry I believe we all have. And so I or have to... In. That stays in the recording. Okay. <laughs> That's good okay. stuff right there. Okay. I think I think we all need to hear this. <laughs> okay, uh, I share this with our missionaries. Is is no matter your circumstance, keep your ministry hat on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't change the hat you wear. At least that's not the hat you take off. Some people put on administrative hats. They put on pastoral hats. They put on uh, uh, leader hats. And I said I have no problem with that. But don't take off the hat of ministry. Because yeah. there's somebody who needs to be served what's in you. They need to be served what you have. It's not easy. Sometimes they're not receptive. Sometimes you miss the opportunity. But mm-hmm. keep that hat on and make it part of your practice because nobody that you're engaging, you're in, you're not engaging anybody by accident. You're mm-hmm. not engaging anyone by chance. And who knows what kind of seed of truth yeah. or seed of righteousness God has placed you in front of them to deposit. And, I, and again, Erica mentioned it from our start. We talked about Esther. She was mindful of the seizure she was in. She needed help keeping that mindfulness, but she was able to deposit things in the people around her that did that not only changed her life, changed the lives of, of thousands or hundreds of thousands of others. Hmm. I, have, I have a partner who um, engaged in this exact sort of conversation. He's not a, an ethnic minority but he came to a diver, very diverse conversation about race in America. And he came to the table not thinking it was a real thing, not thinking there were any issues with it. And as he sat with brothers and sisters, God put something in his heart. And so subsequently, over the years, that seed has grown. And he's actually started this whole nonprofit and, and, and website where it talks about outloving racism. So to mm-hmm. your point, now, um, you just don't know why God has put you in front of somebody. But when your your gaze is narrowed to just, again, the finances or to who or who you won't go to, who you will or you won't go to, then those opportunities for you to partner with God become fewer and fewer and far and far in between. Mm. Yeah. Good word. Right. Well, listen, we're not done. Uh, we're going to do three different episodes, but we are we are going to move uh, to the to closing up this one. One of the uh, you both have said a lot of fantastic things. Uh, one of the things, though, that I I just want to just briefly jump on here as we, as we wrap up this episode is is you know Danielle, that idea that even that you brought up as far as you know your minister hat, your your gospel centered hat, and I just want to encourage people. Um, we're not saying you can't have conversations and, and, and learning and engaging, and we're not saying don't vote. We're not saying any of this stuff. But one of the more common sins I'm seeing by brothers and sisters that are in full time ministry right now is, is them wearing their 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 Democrat hat or their Republican hat or some sort of political right. hat. Um, and honestly, they're putting it on over. Their minister, their their child of God, right. they're they're putting that hat on, um, and it's not helping. It's really not right. helping the conversation. Um, right. So, Danielle, any, anything to, to add to that before we wrap up this episode, or, or, or Erica, I'd love to, I'd love sure. you either hear you affirm that or maybe add to that before we sure. we close up part one of a, what we intend to be a three part episode. What I'll add on is this, and it's it's in this season it has become one of my favorite biblical scenarios. It was it was Joshua entering into the promise, what God had for him, but on his way to being the one that received the promise, he had to defeat Jericho. And Jericho had to be defeated unconventionally. 
instead of siege ramps being built, they were told to march around and pray. And, and the context of it was they had to obey God in something that was uncomfortable. They wanted to do one thing, but God told them to do another thing. And so Joshua, in a time of praying and walking with God, was confronted by an angel. And because, in my opinion, Joshua was in a warlike adversarial stance, he saw the angel and said, whose side are you on? Mm -hmm. And the angel answered, neither. Hmm. And I love that scenario because that's the question that's being asked today. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Who are you going to vote for? What do you believe? Mm -hmm. And really, my answer is it's neither because ultimately the side I want to be on, if you can call it that, is God's side. Yeah. And as you know, and you, as you mentioned, God's not a Republican or a Democrat. And but but there is a biblical, godly response he's called me to have. That's the side I want to be on. Yes, I do feel those tensions. I, I have had those moments where God told me to say something I didn't want to say. God told me to let go of something I wanted to hold on to. God told me to go left when I wanted to go right. You know, I, we could talk about Jonah in a little bit where. He was called to go preach to a people he didn't want to preach to. He didn't want mercy to come their way. He knew God was so good. He'd bring mercy. He didn't want to bring it. But in our case, God's called us to bring mercy. God's called us to engage people that we may not get along with or may not agree with, but engage them not with the truth of my party and the cause of my color, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what he's called us to engage them with. So at the end of the day, it comes back to what I first brought up about being a new creation in Christ. And Galatians puts it this way when we are looking at our allegiances and ultimately those allegiances are idols when they are placed above Christ, his word, who he says he is and who he says we are. Galatians says that for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And again, mm -hmm. our allegiance first and foremost has to be to who he says he is, who we are in light of yeah. what Christ has done for us on the cross and yeah. live according to that by his word and by his spirit. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff. And that's true for heavier conversations such as Race or America. That's even true for lighter conversations like uh, UNC basketball or Duke basketball. But we'll just leave that part right there. So. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us on the SRS podcast. Let's do it again uh, for next week. But uh, Erica Fouché and Danielle Sparks, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Oh, thanks for joining us for this episode. We would love to hear your ideas for future content. Please visit supportraisingsolutions.org slash feedback to share your thoughts and questions. Also, wherever you download your podcast from, be sure to subscribe for future episodes and come back each week to gain more insight into the process of building and maintaining your personal support team. <laughs>